uh, the community there is just incredibly, um, incredibly plugged in. Um, it's just the community um, in the villages around Kedwick. Um, so I was there for two years, um, and uh, in the in the spring of 2008, God called me back, and it was not an easy decision. Um, but uh, I've been grateful to, to be here and have the past few years with my family. I didn't quite understand it at the time. I felt like I finally found a place where I fit and where I belonged and where I had a role. Um, and they still needed a teacher. They still need a teacher, in fact. Um, but God called me back to the United States and back to Kentucky, where I had gone to school. And I've been here for the past four years teaching at a Christian school in Lexington. Um, but uh, about a year and a half ago, God started stirring my heart again um, towards Kenya. And, and I've been hoping and praying that he would do that for many years. Um, since I stepped off the plane in Atlanta, I wanted to go back. <laughs> um, and so um, God has finally opened the doors, and, um, and I'm headed back. My goal is to be there by January um, of 2013. Um, and so uh, my challenge to you tonight, before we go into our question and answer time, if you have more questions about what I do, um, my challenge to you tonight is to... Um, to look around you, there are many people in ministry in your communities, um, not just overseas um, in my ministry, but um, all around us who are struggling to carry the mats of ministry, who need partners to come alongside them, um, both in finances um, and talents and in gifts. Um, and there are many things that we can do to help those in ministry around us carry their mats. And so that's my challenge to you today. So, um, do you have any questions? I know some of the missionaries, like the Bagley and South Africa, talk talking about the Muslim influence in the area here, and I guess with the king are going to be, how, how much that do you see there, or like what part of the population? Um, Kenya is a very, very diverse country, and so um, they actually claim to be 97% Christian, which um, doesn't really mean a whole lot. It doesn't necessarily mean 97%. Seven percent, you know, born again believers. It means ninety percent, ninety-seven percent saw the census and said Christian or Muslim, and they said, "Well, I'm not Muslim," and so they checked Christian. Um, but there is a growing Muslim influence, especially in Nairobi um, and along the coast of Kenya, is heavily Muslim. Um, it's growing a little bit, but um, Kenya is very much fighting back against it. There's a large influence from the Somali pirates um, that have come in because um, they don't want to live in Somalia. I'm, I'm sure you all have seen that in the news where they've captured ships and the people who have gotten that money, nobody wants to live in Somalia. It's a pretty awful place. There's no infrastructure. There's no, there's nothing there. And so they're, they're moving into Kenya. So there's kind of a fight back against the Muslim influence a little bit. But again, I haven't been there in four years. Excuse me. And so um, that's my general observations from afar and from what I've heard. No. What had the government been um, Kenya has um, has a democracy. Um, uh, back in 2008, my last six months there, there was a lot of election violence around the around the elections. Um, but um, there will be an election this coming March, um, and um, I, we're hoping that it will be, will be more peaceful than it was the first time. I've been reading uh, in the USA Today about some of the changes that you're talking about. Uh, it sounds to me not it's not as uh, Christian friendly as it once was. I guess because of the Muslim you were just talking about, because a great concern there. And when I read that, because I always thought that Kenya was pretty friendly to people coming in, and even like yourself. Uh, how how uh, close to uh, the part of the city is this hospital? Um, Kenwick is actually three and a half hours outside of Nairobi. It's, it's a very very rural area. Um, that might so, be to its advantage. Oh. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Nairobi's not a, um, it's, even at the best of times, it's pretty crime ridden. Um, there are barbed wire fences and tall um, fences around pretty much everything. Um, it's, it's a tough place to live in. So thankfully, we don't, we don't live in that kind of environment. Where we live is very open to gospel and, um, and very friendly towards us. Um, they recognize the value of having a hospital there that not only provides medical care, but also jobs for several hundred Kenyans in the community. What's your, what's your housing? Um, there are, um, where I will be living is an apartment. Um, there are a lot of people in the community that live in mud huts, the kind of picturesque things that you see. Um, but we have more permanent housing um, around the hospital for employees and for missionaries who live there. Is that on the hospital grounds? Or is um, yes, it's actually what the hospital owns, but the there's a hospital with a fenced-in area, and then the homes are kind of down the hill around it. 
Yes, ma'am. You mentioned a while ago your dad knows the hospital. Um, I don't know your dad's age, but I was wondering what you thought about maybe if dad should retire, he's going back to the hospital and together you could work together at that place. Is that a possibility? Um, well, my dad's actually, he's not a doctor. He's actually um, a writer. Um, but I'm saying you said he knew the hospital he and knew he recommended the hospital. the hospital. And he must have had some direct contact with the hospital, which means maybe he's still interested in and if it's a place where he could but it could be a family thing instead of, I mean, it's wonderful you're there. Yeah. But I just wondered, is it, has that been explored? Um, no, I, I don't think, um, I think that would be wonderful. I would, you know, it's kind of my dream to be, be able to be in Kenya and live near family. It's every missionary's dream um, to have your family on the mission field with you. Um, but I don't think it's very likely. You pray about that because if Dad was interested once, he probably still is very interested, particularly with your being there. Well, thank you. Yeah. I'll mention that to him. Yes. We'll see what he says. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions about yeah. anything? Yeah. I do remember my first year of teaching, by the way. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. I apologize. It, it's one of those unforgettable things. Yes. I, I'm curious about the students you teach as far as what their needs are and, and what kind of situations, what kind of needs they have. Um, just in terms of their educational needs, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I guess I didn't, I'd forgotten that, um, that section. Um, it's a one-room schoolhouse. We work with a bunch of different ages. I try to, we try to pick the largest age group. Um, and this, um, when I was there the first time, it was a second, third grade group that was the largest age group. And so we, we focused on them and we did a regular school day with them. Um, I guess I'll step back here for um, the microphone is. Um, we did a regular school day with them in the mornings, math and science and language arts, just a very typical American um, uh, elementary school classroom. Um, and then in the afternoons, we did supplemental things. The middle schoolers and the younger elementary, the preschoolers, did most of their work at home with the moms. Um, and, uh, but they, come to, they came to me in the afternoons for things like art and PE. Um, I did middle school science one year. Um, a couple different levels, uh, uh, art and PE, creative writing, um, and that kind of thing. Do you have special needs students? Um, not particularly. Um, I have a couple of different kids that have um, ADHD and that kind of, um, um, we have a couple of kids who have, um, are OCD diagnosed and ADHD, but um, nothing more than that. What language do you teach in? Um, I teach in English. Um, the, they're actually, um, Kenyan kids actually speak three languages. They speak a tribal language. Around us it's Kipsigis. Um, and they also speak the, the national language, which is Kiswahili, which I will be learning when I go back. And I'm really excited about that because I didn't learn it very much when I was there before. Um, and, they also, um, and they teach English in the schools. And so, um, Anybody you, you meet under the age of um, 30 will know English pretty much, wow. even in the rural areas, because they, they blend it in the schools, which is a wonderful thing. Their English is far better than my Swahili will ever be. <laughs> <laughs> are, the, are the parents, I mean, are the parents that are the, the children that have parents, are they pretty involved in the school, or are they just, they seem in the distance? Um, the, the children I teach, um, it's a homeschool co-op kind of situation. I work right with the parents and we talk about what they want their kids to learn. They're very involved. Um, they, we have a meeting at the end of every year to, to look at what classes we need to teach the next year. And they talk about what they want their kids to learn and um, how their kids learn. And we pick curriculum that fits that. And um, it's, in my opinion, I think it's pure education. I think it's about as, as pure as you get. There's you know, nobody else saying this is what your kids should learn. It's the parents who are making the choices. I love that. Now, is there any, uh, I know it's Christian based, mm -hmm. but is there any like evolution to creation like mishaps over there? Like, I know over here there's the, the fight between evolution and creation, but I didn't know if that's even um, a thing over there. Um, in Kenya, I don't, um, in Kenyan schools, I don't think they get into that at all. Um, I think they're very strongly Christian. I think they were just teach creation. Um, excuse me, let me grab a drink of water. Um, in my middle school science classes, 